Well, greetings, everyone. My name is Tim Kyes of GodSaveTheKing.org, and welcome to my show, God Save the King, uh, Friday nights at 10 p.m. on the Truth Be Told radio network. And I am joined today by Mr. Kevin Gallagher, and Kevin is the CEO of the Truth Be Told radio network, so it's a real pleasure to have him on here with me tonight. Kevin, why don't you uh, take a moment and uh, introduce yourself and tell my listeners, if you are on your network, a little bit about you and what you do. Hey, uh, this is Kevin, and uh, the network started about, uh, it was started, started on April the 10th of 2018. We've been on the air 24 hours a day, um, and you can listen a bunch of different ways. Um, one of the things that we're very aggressive at doing is we want to be the go-to Christian radio network when you're listening on a smart device. Now, that can include a smart speaker made by Amazon, you know, the Alexa, the Google speaker, or the HomePod, or people forget that your smartphones are smart devices. So your, your Google Android device, which has the Google Assistant built into it, or the Apple iPhone, which has the Siri Assistant built into the phone. Uh, these are the same exact assistants that are built into their smart speakers. There is absolutely no difference. So you're able to access the network that way, plus through TuneIn Radio. Uh, My Tuner is software you can download. <coughs> Excuse me. Software you can download to your to either one of those phones, to even an Amazon Fire Stick or an Android tablet and, and uh, a tablet made by, say, Apple or something like that, you have um, a number of different aggregates that are out there, which are uh, databases that Wi-Fi radios would use in order to uh, have you find the stations to listen to. So we're in about 15, 17, 20 different ones of those. I, I've lost count, but there's a number of ways. And, and if people contact me at contact at truthbetoldnetwork.org, I can send them the uh, current listening schedule, the broadcast schedule, and also a little form that tells them all the different ways that they can listen. So um, it's one of the ways that we're getting out and we're hitting with that anywhere between 25 at a low number and 35 really is the high uh, number of countries that we hit week in and week out. That's that's fabulous. That's, yeah. I, I definitely want you to tell our audience that, you know, that this this is a great way uh, to get the message out there. Uh, Kevin uh, has a number of tremendous shows on the Truth Be Told Radio Network. Kevin, just take a few more seconds here, maybe another minute or so, and run down the list of everybody that's on the Truth Be Told Radio Network. I'm not going to remember everybody. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, give, us, give us some highlights. <clears throat> There's – um. There is, let's see, there is right now I, I, 32, 34, 35 shows, something like that, that are running on the network every week. Uh, your show, which I call a native show, it's produced by the network for the network, and it goes out here on the network. But we also have shows that are imported. Uh, we have some great shows from um, Sid Roth is here. John Kilpatrick is here. We have, I'm um, trying to think of some of the other people that we have, Dale Sides. Um, we have shows from him, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, you have, uh, let's see, uh, I said Sid Roth. I said all those guys. There's a, a number uh, of hosts. You and I were talking about Mel Novak earlier. Mel Novak is another one. He produces shows here for the network, and also he appears on Omega Man Radio. In case you don't know who Mel is, Mel Novak, is. if the name rings a bell, he was – and is a Hollywood actor. He uh, starred in the movie Game of Death. He played Stick the Assassin and actually fought Bruce Lee on camera, which is kind of cool. And he's been a pastor for like 40 years. He's brought thousands, hundreds of thousands, 300,000, I think, people to Christ. He was also um, involved in bringing um, Steve McQueen to Christ before he died. Hmm. It's, it's so. really interesting that I never... <laughs> You know, we, we were talking a little bit off camera about how Mel has a ministry to Skid Row. And I spent yeah. 20 years in Los Angeles and have been to Skid Row, you know, many times. And yet and, and you know, rubbed elbows with that community. I mean, I was not in the, you know, the TV, radio community, the Hollywood community, but yeah. I was definitely on the fringes of it. There's no question about that. And, knew, you know, and rubbed elbows with a lot of people that our names people would recognize. So yeah. kind of funny that I never ran into Mel because, and now we're, you know, all the way across the country and likely to, you know, start doing stuff together now would be really funny. Just yeah. ironic how God the, the irony of it all to be, you know, yeah. you in Pennsylvania, him in California. And, yeah. When know. I was just there. Yeah. <laughs> funny. It's funny. 
Well, I, you know, I invited Kevin to be on the show today because it's always great to have a counterpoint when we talk about these things. Really great to have a, uh, you know, a counterpoint to have a, a conversation, you know, a con- not necessarily a lecture because we don't always learn really well through lectures. We learn best when we're, when we're actually just having a conversation with each other. And then so to have another voice on here, another person to talk, talk with can really help people understand this, especially if you're just listening on radio and you're not watching us on, on the internet here. And Kevin and I were talking uh, off camera about what we wanted to talk about today. And I brought up the fact that as I was doing my show prep for a different show, I happened to trip over a documentary online, and this was, I don't know a lot about the the network or the show itself. It was a show called Timeline, and for all practical purposes, it sure looked like, you know, a straight up, you know, documentary, right? And it appeared that several of the guests or the experts that were on there were, you know, they had the right credentials and everything to really speak on the subject matter. And it was a documentary about Herod the Great. And they opened up the show. And I mean, within the first 30 seconds, they said something that is historically inaccurate. Hmm. And I mean, and it just kind of blew me away. And I, I didn't pay close attention to the entire documentary because I didn't have the time, but I, I put it on the back in the background as I was doing some other stuff and I'm listening and every once in a while, something would catch my attention. And I just by paying very casual attention, I noticed four or five different facts that they mentioned that are demonstrably incorrect. And it all goes to this, core component of God Save the King, which is that, you know, I've now come to the understanding that I believe Mm -hmm. that the traditional nativity story is Christian mythology. It's just not how the nativity really would have happened. I mean, you can read the scroll here down at the bottom of the screen that says God Save the King. Maybe the nativity doesn't look like we think it does because it doesn't. And, you know, and it's really interesting that, you know, if you watch virtually any documentary on TV these days, within the first couple of minutes, whoever the narrator is, is going to say, yeah, you know, the legend goes like this, X, Y, Z. But the truth is, it probably looked more like this. And then they go into the documentary and that could be about anybody. It could be my favorite examples that I always use over and over is it could be, you could be talking about Wyatt Earp or you could be talking about, you know, you know, Robin Hood or King Arthur who are, you know, pseudo fictitious, or you could be talking about Ragnar Lothbrook or Genghis Khan. It doesn't matter who you're talking about. They're going to, you're going to get that same thing. You know um, yeah, the legend is like this, but the truth is probably more like this. And you know what? The nativity is no different. Yeah. So one of the things they said, I kind of want to get your reaction to this because, you know, here I'm the, I'm the content expert and Kevin is joining me to have a conversation here today. So let me throw this one at you, Kevin. So this is one of the things they said right out of the gate. So let's, let's get your reaction here because you yeah. know, the traditional nativity story. And then you, you know, from, uh, you know, kicking things around with me, you know, a lot more about what it really looked like now. One of the first things they said is they wanted to address this issue of the slaughter of the innocents, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's one of the more well-known components of the nativity story, traditional or correct, either one, right? It's one of the more well-known components of the nativity story Mm -hmm. is that Herod apparently, you know, killed all the male children in and around Bethlehem. And so here we are, we're less than five minutes into the show. And they said, yeah, Herod was responsible for the murder of thousands of babies around Bethlehem. How do you react to that? Well, you know, what I know about that is is this, is the so-called the wise men. And there weren't three. We both know that. We know that there was many, many people that showed up in in Jerusalem. (laughs) Yeah. You know, so what happens is they had to take some period of time to make it from what would be, I guess, Iran all the way into Israel. Mm -hmm. And they're traveling the Silk Road, a large 
group of people, thousands of people traveling. Mm -hmm. they, they would travel with their their wives, their families, their you know you know you got your children, everything, all the supplies they were needed, plus a whole army of men to defend them, so that nobody would mess with them as they were traveling from where they were to where they were going. So. <clears throat> So it had to be that period of time. So when Herod had his people do calculations, that's one of the reasons why you would say something like, well, you know, it was, uh, you know, it took them this long. They make some estimates. Now, this is my understanding. I, I mm -hmm. may be wrong. And so that's why you would see something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm driving at is that. So here, here I am watching this documentary. And like mm -hmm. I said, first five minutes of the show, right? I mean, boom, right out of the gate. They say, oh, yeah, slaughter of the innocents. Herod was responsible for the murder of thousands of male children, two years old and younger in and around Bethlehem. So the reason I was searching for your reaction is because how do you kill thousands of babies when the population of Bethlehem is only 400 people? Wow. I didn't know it was that low. Yeah, it was a tiny little village, a tiny little village. You'd be stretching it if the population of Bethlehem was a thousand people. Okay, really? Now, see, I learned something because I didn't know that. Right. So, so realistically, Bethlehem was a small village of probably between four and six hundred people, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then, like I said, you'd be stretching it if you hit a thousand, right? Mm. And then, you know, you would have to go several miles in any given direction to hit another village, right? Now, there were villages everywhere, don't get me wrong, okay? But it was not a densely populated region, not right. at all. So here it is, because this is the point. The whole point I'm making here is that that's the tradition, right? The tradition yeah. is that this slaughter of the innocents, which is horrific regardless of the number, okay? Mm -hmm. It's it's absolutely awful regardless of the number, yeah. But the point is, is that here is what's supposed to be a legitimate documentary simply repeating what they've heard and they've never checked it. Yeah. I mean, did, did no content expert on this show think about that for a second and go, wait a second, Bethlehem's a little village. You you, you just slaughtered the whole village times 10, not... Yeah. <laughs> pardon me, not just the children. So, I mean, and then over time, as I've done my research, I have run into several sources of that have corroborated my theory, which is right. that I think the number is under 20. Really? Yeah. I think the number of male children that were actually murdered by Herod on this occasion is eight, 10, 12. Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't thousands like we're traditionally taught. Right. No, yeah, no, I don't think there's any way, and, and there's several reasons why I think this number. In it's funny because the in the uh, on these documentaries they use circular reasoning, and don't even realize they're doing it because like right. later in the sh later in the show, see, because these guys, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Hmm. They were defending Herod, and saying he didn't do it. They're sitting here going, oh, yeah, uh, I don't know that the slaughter of the innocents actually even occurred. And I'm like, what are you, crazy? You know, and they're and they're they're acknowledging in the same sentence, they're acknowledging the fact that Herod was very cruel and very tyrannical and that he killed several of his own family members to protect his throne. So here they acknowledge that. And then they turn around and they say, oh, yeah, but the slaughter of the innocents. Oh, no, that didn't. Really, I got real questions about whether that even happened or not. And then one of the funny things they said was, and see, and this is part of their proof, right? Or their, their so-called proof right. is they said, well, you know, the historian Josephus never mentions it. And certainly if he, if Herod had killed hundreds or thousands of babies around Bethlehem, that Josephus, Josephus, Josephus would have mentioned it. But if it's only 10 or 20 kids, and my theory is that unlike other occasions where Herod would have made a great show of killing his enemies, if he deliberately kept it quiet, well, then no wonder Josephus didn't know. Yeah. You know? Well, let me ask you a question. Sure. Why would he deliberately keep it quiet? Well, because he's killing children for one thing. 
Okay, it's 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 one thing to kill your political enemy in an environment where that is expected. Okay, it's something else to randomly mm-hmm. murder a couple of dozen children in a small village. Okay, mm-hmm. and and especially given Herod's background of the fact that he was not ethnically Jewish. He was an Idumean or an Edomite or a descendant of Esau, right? Mm-hmm. Who had converted to Judaism as a religion, okay? But possibly largely out of political expediency. We don't we don't really know for sure whether he really believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or whether he followed the Jewish religion strictly for political expediency because mm-hmm. he was an extraordinarily ambitious man. Right. Right. So if we lean that way and say, okay, well, let's assume for a second, let's assume for a second that it was political expediency. Right. And he was not popular with his own, quote unquote, subjects. Right. Mm -hmm. This is when you're using the phrase subject and you mean it in that skewed kind of fashion. These are not his loyal subjects. These are his this is the loyal opposition. This, these are the ones who are like, you know, no way. We don't like this guy. He's not Jewish. He's not from the right tribe. He's not from the right nation. And he's appointed by Rome, who is our enemies. And we, he's not, he doesn't really practice the religion right. So we don't, we can't stand the guy, right? Mm-hmm. So the Romans and Herod both actually bent over backwards on many occasions to really walk a fine line between crushing the Jews, you know, and putting them under their thumb and getting what they wanted and making sure they didn't needlessly offend them. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they off. So that's why I think it's a real possibility that even though he very openly um, executed a couple of his own wives and a couple of his own sons to protect his throne, I think when it came to the slaughter of the innocents, he, as the way I like to say it, is he sent in his black ops team and just kept it quick and quiet and under the radar so that no one would know. Now, the Bible goes on to say there was there was great lament. And of course, there would be in and around Bethlehem. Of course, mm-hmm. there would be that. Oh, even, yeah. Yeah. Even a small number, but in a small village like that. OK. Oh, my word. That would be that would be devastating and just horribly traumatic to have his troops swoop into town and scoop up all the male children and kill them and run, run back out in the, in the dead of night and they're gone. You know, I mean, that would be horrific, but another reason, just by the way, another reason I think that it was smaller in scale than we realize is that um, John the Baptist, the young John the Baptist fits that category, right? Mm. He would have been a male child under two years of age, and he was only five miles away. Wow. Okay. So if he's only five miles away and they didn't get him, that tells me that the scope of what they were doing was probably relatively small. So it was localized. It was localized. Yeah. Because like we said, Bethlehem actually would have been a very small village, very small village, Mm -hmm. not big at all. So even if they went, a mile outside of town or a mile and a half, you know, they didn't need to go five miles in every direction, you know, to make sure that they were getting all the babes in Bethlehem. They only had to stick right there to that village. That was it. Yeah. See, you cause know? here I'm, I'm catching an error in my own thinking because mm-hmm. I'm thinking maybe like modern day Bethlehem in a more, more cosmopolitan, I guess sure. would be the word to use and not like a small little village. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Correct. Yeah, I mean, and and I do the same thing. We all do the same thing. Is is like modern Bethlehem is within the metropolis of Jerusalem today. Mm-hmm. It's only five miles, only five six miles. Yeah. Right. So it's it's with you know it's a suburb of Jerusalem now, but if you go back, you know, two thousand years or certain, I mean, you could even only go back five hundred years would probably be the same. Which is that if you've ever lived in the country. Right. And you've lived in a small town like I'm in a relatively small town now, but I've lived in an even smaller town on a couple of occasions before. Right. And yeah, the town itself just really isn't that big. And then, yeah, you've got to go five miles down the road before you hit the next town. 
So if someone said, yeah, we're only going to deal very specifically with this location. Yeah. You know, five miles down the road. Yeah. That's, that's, that's enough to make the distinction. So, but I just found it interesting. Like I said, that here I am watching what I am assuming is a, you know, a, a straightforward, legitimate documentary. And in the very first few minutes, they say, oh yeah, Herod the Great killed, you know, killed thousands of babies. And that then they turn around and use this for the reason why they think it didn't happen, hmm. you know, citing that, well, Josephus would have noticed, but yeah, if it was only a small handful, then yeah, Josephus might not have noticed. So n- not to beat that to death, but you know, then another thing they said in this documentary was they said that you, we already talked about it. You indicated it is they said, ready? And I quote, the Bible teaches that three wise men visited Jesus. Yeah. Right. And you're shaking your head, you know, yes, because you know exactly what we're going to say, which is that, no, the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say it. Yeah. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, it doesn't say the number, does it? It tells us the number of the gifts, right? Which is clearly where that comes from, right? The tradition revolves around the three gifts that the wise men gave to uh, the baby Jesus or not. Huh? See, not see Then I caught myself the young child, Jesus. Yeah. He's not a baby anymore. Right. See, and that is how much the traditional story has permeated our mindset is here. Well, yeah, Tim. I mean, you, you get the images. I mean, I've even been to uh, radio city music hall a couple of times to see the holiday show. Right. And at the end, they do this spectacular looking nativity. It's completely historically incorrect, but man, it looks great. And you have to hand it to them. I mean, it looks fantastic. Uh-huh. And uh, the lighting, everything, the way they pull it off, I mean, it looks really, really good. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, the whole the whole thing <coughs> is, as I learned over the years, you know, the the shepherds were there that night, and they, were, they had to be there at just the right time, the correct. timing, uh-huh. because of the swaddling clothes a baby wouldn't be kept in those for very long. So they were there just precisely the right time, just as they were told. And they had to be nearby. Yep. That, I mean, that is a stunning, that is one of the stunning (laughs) moments of the story is the fact that, you know, when the angels appeared to the shepherds and said, you know, get up and go into town and you will find the, you know, the Jewish Messiah, you know, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, that is an extraordinary prophecy because, as you just said, swaddling clothes, they were old, they were ceremonial. You, mm-hmm. you, they, would, uh, they would wash the baby in salt water, and then they would wrap him in these what they called swaddling clothes, which was really like strip, just strips of cloth, like, a, like you would wrap, frankly, like you would wrap a mummy. Yeah, really what you would do, and they would wrap him up, and they would take his arms and legs and put them out very straight, and then bind them with these cloths. And then, when the baby was all washed and swaddled, okay, and like I said, they would wash him in salt water because that was antiseptic. Mm-hmm. And then they'd wrap him in these swaddling clothes, and then they would pray over the baby and dedicate the baby to the Lord. So this was referred to as being washed and swaddled, right? And it was an insult to tell someone you were neither washed nor swaddled. Yeah. Right? So, but yeah, they, the, but then they would pray over the child and then they take the swaddling clothes off, you know, and then that was it. So, yeah. So how long of a time would that be? Like 10 minutes, 15, 10, 20 10, minutes? 15 minutes. Yeah. Maybe even shorter, but I don't imagine it's more than 10, 15, maybe 20 at the outside. And and the other thing I would love to know is um, how did the shepherds know what, where to go? How how did they know where to go to, to, to get that time just right? Right. Well, once again, see, Bethlehem had to be a very small village. It had to be because they, now, because we can assume and it's not, (coughs) it's not wrong to admit, to assume so, we can assume that they were had a little bit of divine guidance, so to speak, right? Yeah, a little bit of a uh, little bit of divine GPS on where to go. But at the same time, if you've got a village that is too big, how are they going to find him? 
Mm -hmm. right? Because another part of this that, you know, that I am introducing, most people have never heard this. You've heard me talk about it right. due, to, due to our interviews, but most people out there haven't heard this yet. He wasn't in a stable. Okay. He was in a standard Judean home, which means they had to, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, knock on the door and go, Hey, any babies in here? You know, mm -hmm. so because we assumed that if he was in a stable, that that meant a semi open environment and that they could find the stable and kind of peer in and go, oh, look, you know, there's a baby. OK, found the right place. Right. But ironically, that's not the case. He was in a Judean home and they would have literally had to have, you know, knocked on the door. So, to speak. so, so let me ask you a question. I, I'm curious. You it says in the Bible that there was no room for them at the inn. So right. what does that mean then if I'm not understanding it according to my Western thinking? Yeah, very good. Well, it's, it's, very, it's very clear and obvious in the Greek, okay? So if you look at the Greek word that is translated in, which we assume means motel, right? Mm -hmm. That is the Greek word kataluma, all right? And the Greek word kataluma is better translated guest room, okay? okay. Now, a guest room could be rented out. So that's where the confusion can lie is in the fact that a guest room could be rented out because we have another record also in the gospel of Luke where the word cataluma is used to help us understand what a cataluma looks like. Okay. And that is the record where Jesus is sending the disciples into town and he's sending them. He says, go into town and you will find a certain man and that man will lead you to a private room where we can celebrate the Passover. Okay. So they meet this certain man and this certain man takes them to his own home and says, here is the guest room, the Cataluma that you can use to hold the Passover. Okay. But it really is a guest room. Okay. It's where you would put your relatives when your relatives came to visit or if you were so inclined, you could rent it out on special occasions to visitors or guests of that nature. But the contrasting word is the Greek word pondokian. Okay. Now okay. I should mention this before I even give you the punchline. I originally noticed this because in every traditional nativity play we've ever seen, there is an innkeeper. Right but there's no innkeeper in the record. Hmm. Okay. Right. So think about it for a minute. They, you know, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, put him in a manger because there's no room in the inn, which like, again, we assume means motel, but yeah. there's no mention of this innkeeper, right? He's not mentioned there at all. Now, if it is indeed a commercial traveler's in, then the presence of an innkeeper is logically supplied. Okay. But mm -hmm. if that's not what it means and there's no innkeeper mentioned in the record, maybe we have an entirely wrong picture. And mm -hmm. do because a traveler's in, a commercial traveler's in in Greek is called a Pondokian. Okay. And we find Pondokian, and this is great because this is all in Luke, right? And Luke would have used his language consistently, right? right? So in the record of the Good Samaritan, it says that the wounded man is taken by the Samaritan to a Pondokian, to a traveler's inn. And it says that he pays the Pondokias, the innkeeper, to take care of the wounded man and that he'll return and that if it costs more money, he'll give him more money. But there we have a straight up comparison between a Cataluma, a guest room, mm -hmm. right? And a Pondokian, a traveler's inn. And it's not a traveler's inn. It's a guest room in a private mm -hmm. home, right? Very interesting. So when we, so then when you plug in the fact, because this is important too, when you plug in the fact that Joseph and Mary were traveling to their ancestral hometown, right? That means the likelihood that they were staying with relatives is extraordinarily high. This was an uncle or a brother or a something of most likely of Joseph, not of Mary. 
uh, because that's just the way it would have worked in a, you know, somewhat in a patriarchal society. Yeah. You know, and so, but the likelihood that they were staying with someone, one of Joseph's relatives is extremely high, plus the nature of the registration, right? This was an oath of allegiance to Caesar is what was going on. And the notable citizens were the ones who would have had to have registered, which is why it's the house and lineage of David is so critical. And both Joseph and Mary were of that house and of that lineage of the descendants of David. So mm -hmm. that's why they had to travel to their ancestral hometown, but they would not have been the only Judeans living in Galilee that would mm -hmm. have had to have traveled back to Bethlehem. Right. Plus, generally speaking, you usually usually didn't travel just two people if you could avoid in a larger number if you could, right? Yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, it's in the very next chapter, Luke chapter 3, we see the record of Joseph and Mary going to the Passover every year. And it mentions the fact that, you know, Jesus was 12 years old. And he had stayed behind in the temple. And it says, and when they searched the entire caravan, they couldn't find him. Well, there it is, right in the same gospel. We have a record of it telling us, generally speaking, how they would have traveled, see? So it stands to reason that, okay, you know, maybe Joseph and Mary traveled alone, just the two of them, maybe. But most likely they traveled with other family members from Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem in particular, and they show up at the home of a relative. And if you're adding four, six, eight, ten 10 people to a standard Judean home, well, yeah, you'll pack as many as you can in the guest room, but a traditional Judean home, we're talking about a large one room home anyway. We just had one big central room where everybody yeah. would have ate and slept anyhow. That's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. That's, that's you know? pretty wild. Yeah, that's so pretty wild. So it just means that someone else got the the guest room, and that Joseph and Mary slept in the common room with everybody else. And then, by the way, to 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 fully paint the picture, since we're there, you know, if you have a large rectangular room, right? So it's maybe sixteen to twenty feet wide and twenty four to thirty feet long, right? And that's mm -hmm. your large one room. That's your large one room house, right? But at one end, you've got the guest room. So you've put up a heavy curtain or maybe a makeshift wall of some type to protect, you know, to be, give some people some privacy and some separation, right? But then at the other end of the rectangle is where they would have dug down into the earth about three feet, right? And created this lower area hmm. where they would have kept the household animals. Okay. OK, and then so that creates a shelf, you know, right. You creates a shelf of about three feet and then they would put the feeding trough for the animals on this shelf. Right. Huh. So if you think about a cow. Right. Or a sheep or a goat or whatever yeah. they're standing in this lower area. And now this three foot shelf, there's their feeding trough and it's right there. They can just reach over and eat. It's very okay. easy. Right. Well, that feeding trough is called a manger. Hmm. That's, that's what a manger is. And they were made out of stone. They weren't made out of wood. And the reason they were made out of stone was because that way the animals couldn't tip them over. Got it. Okay. Makes but the perfect iron sense. Makes perfect sense. Right. And now when you think about it, you got this lowered area at one end, you've got the guest room at the other, the guest room is full. Everybody else sleeps in the large common area but these mangers, these animal troughs, they're in the large common area. That's where they are. Hmm. Okay. So I love to say it this way. The manger was in the living room. Huh. That, there it is. The manger is in the living room. So it really, it's a totally different picture than we're used to. You know, and since we're talking about it, let's just go there. We'll just have some fun and talk about it. The, the culture, we always we got to also have to remember that Judean culture was a hospitality culture. Okay. Okay. You see, here's here's another reason. These are more reasons why we know it was not a traveler's inn. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to click off two or three reasons here. It's not just one, it's not just the Greek. Now, that's one very good reason right there, but here's another. 
in 150 years of archaeological expeditions around Bethlehem, they've never found an inn. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. They've never found a traveler's inn. Now, you always got to be really careful when you use that kind of evidence because, you know, I could stick my foot in my mouth and they could find one next week. But, mm -hmm. you know, the irony is, is yeah, in 150 years of archaeological expeditions, they've never found a traveler's inn in Bethlehem because it was well, too small to need one. Yeah, because like you were saying, if there's that few people there, you wouldn't need a, a place to put travelers. People most likely wouldn't be traveling there. They'd be traveling to like Jerusalem. Right. See, and that's another, that's, and that's a great point. Very observant. That's a great point because number one, travelers inns existed. Okay. By this point in time, but they weren't super common. They weren't like all over the place. And typically where you would find them, however, was that you would find them in larger metropolitan areas, larger populace, and then you would find them approximately one day's journey from the larger population centers. That would make sense because you travel a day and need a place to stay place because it'd be too dangerous to stay out at night somewhere. Exactly, right? So Bethlehem is actually too close to Jerusalem. It's only five or six miles where you really need the travelers in, right? See, and Bethlehem, and geez, I love doing this because it gets me gives me a chance to do this stuff. And, and, and it's to share these details. And that is, is we're talking about a country that had roads here. Okay. We, 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 we get these mind pictures entrenched in our minds that we think that Mary and Joseph just took off across country. No, mm -hmm. they followed the roads. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> they would have traveled on a road, right? Well, the Romans were th what they were really big on. And since the Romans were occupying Israel at that time, they were looking at taxation mm -hmm. and roads because Correct. both those things to the Roman mind was a projection of their power. Exactly. So now we don't know for sure whether they were on a Roman maintained road or not. They may have been, but mm -hmm. again, excellent observation because number one, the Romans were big time road builders. Also, you're talking that they are under the administration of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was a very talented builder and really uh, improved the infrastructure of Israel, right? So the likelihood that he improved the roads is extraordinarily high. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Joseph and Mary likely traveled one of two, two routes. Okay. One is that they would have left Nazareth and headed east until they hit the Jordan River Valley and then followed the Jordan River Valley basically until you get to Jericho, at which point they would have turned due west and then gone to Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a second because I don't think that's the route they, the route they took, but that's one potential route. I think the route they took is a route that is known as the way of the patriarchs, okay? And the reason it's known as the way of the patriarchs is because it, we have records in the Bible of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all traveling on this same road, okay? So it's called the way of the patriarchs. And Bethlehem, is a, it's not right on it, but it is adjacent to the road of the patriarchs, right? Mm -hmm. Because even if they took the Jordan River Valley route and then traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem via the road that is called the Red Ascent. See, because this, when you do research, this is what you find. They had roads and the roads had names, right? Mm -hmm. So just from, like we do today, right? Just like we do today. So the road from, from Jericho to Jerusalem is called the Red Ascent. All right. And the reason it's called the Red Ascent is because, uh, forgive me if I don't have the numbers exactly correct, but Jericho is 1,200 feet below sea level. Okay. Okay. It's one of the lowest spots on the earth. Okay. And then uh, I might not have that exactly right, but the point being is that Jericho is below sea level. Okay. Okay. And then Jerusalem is like at, 3,000 feet roughly, okay? And they're like 21 miles apart, somewhere 20 to 25 and miles apart. you got apart. a huge drop. Oh, my God. That's an insane ascent, 
It's I, I did the math. I just don't have my notes in front of me. I did the math. That's like a 12% grade. Okay. And like the U, the U S department of transportation, we limit our, our interstates to like 7%. Okay. And that's like a 12% grade. That's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. And there, and because it was very mountainous. Okay. There would be rocks and mountains on either side of the roadway, which meant it was a very good place for bandits to hide and attack mm-hmm. people and things like that. And bec- because of having mountains and rocks immediately on either side, that created all kinds of wonderful shadows for the bandits to hide in, right? Now, this makes complete sense because now it connects all this information together because the red ascent was also known as the valley of the shadow of death. Huh. Okay. So, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, right? right. That's the road that David was talking about was the red ascent. Okay. Okay. That's also the road that the the wounded man is on who was helped by the Samaritan. Okay. And th- that makes complete sense because it says he was attacked on the road. Okay. And so that, that story that Jesus told was so believable. And everybody at that time knows exactly what he's talking about because Jesus was a master at taking very mundane, everyday things that people would see in their lives and extracting great truths out of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really amazing, Messy, because now you can see this is a big part of why I'm so convinced about a lot of the research I've done is because you can't make this up. No, you, you can't, can't get these can't. pieces to fit together like this from multiple independent records that all corroborate. Yeah. So you've got, you know, you've, so you've got the, yeah, like, it, you've got like the, the, uh, the whole thing of the good Samaritan. You've got David calling <clears> the, <throat> the shadow of death, you know, this whole thing. And it's the red ascent you see, cause it's bloody. It's mm-hmm. dangerous. It's a dangerous place to travel. Right. But my point that I want to get back to is that even if Joseph and Mary did take the Jordan River Valley Road and then the red ascent from uh, Jericho to Jerusalem, then they would have had to have picked up the way of the patriarchs to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. So they would have had, they would have been on that road eventually anyway, but I think they took the road of the patriarchs all the way from it it doesn't run through Nazareth. They would have had to have gone south from Nazareth on whatever what the local road was there until they got to like the Jezreel Valley. And then once they picked up the Jezreel Valley, then they would have picked up the way of the patriarchs. Now, another name for the road of the patriarchs or the way of the patriarchs is that it was also called the Ridge Route because, ridge. It, tra- because it, travel- it traveled the ridge of the Sumerian and Judean mountains. Hmm. Okay. So it was also called the Ridge Route or the Ridge Road, right? So it's just really interesting that all these pieces fit together the way they did. So when, so again, they would have traveled like, see, because this is back to that whole thing. They would have traveled in a group for safety and for expediency. And along the road, see, there wouldn't have been inns every two, three, four miles. That's not how the way it worked. There would have been inns approximately every one day's journey apart, right? That makes perfect sense. Right. So, so once again, we're back to, now we're back to the, the thing about no room in the inn. Okay. So look at what we're stacking up for evidence. Now the Greek words aren't correct. The Greek word doesn't say it's a traveler's inn, right? Mm -hmm. Um, No traveler's inn found in the archeological digs. Okay, common practice was that although inns existed at that day and time, they wouldn't have been every five or six miles. They would have been every 20 miles, right? So it's not really the right position for a traveler's inn. Bethlehem would have been too small to require a traveler's inn. And then the final thing is that this was a hospitality culture. Okay, the the Jews were encouraged to be hospitable to strangers. That's part of the Torah is mm-hmm. that they're told to be hospitable to strangers. And as a matter of fact, we have a very interesting record in the book of Judges. Now it's really an extraordinarily sordid 
story. It's an ugly, ugly story, but it's interesting that it also happens in Bethlehem. It also involves travelers, and therefore it clearly involves the Ridge Road, which is there is the record of this man traveling with um, a servant and one of his concubines, I think it is if I remember right, and it says when they get to Bethlehem, they go into the town square and they sit down. Because that was the cultural statement that said, well, we need a place to stay. Okay. Okay. But they couldn't find a place to stay. They mm. Or I, I take that back. I, I got it flipped in my head. They did find a place to stay. They were shown hospitality. See, and that's the point. That was how it worked in that culture was if you were a traveler on the road and you went to a town that you weren't familiar with and you needed lodging, you would go into the town square and you'd sit. You'd sit down. Yep, and you'd sit. And you would just wait for someone to walk up to you and say, need a place to stay? So did they have like a designated place that they would know this is where I would go sit because then people would know that I'm looking for lodging or need lodging? Yeah, well, if you think about it, if it's the town square, quote unquote, yeah. there's probably a well, right? A well for water. There's probably a market, a small market or something like that. So it would just be a very conspicuous spot in the center of town mm -hmm. and you just go and cop a squat and wait for someone to, you know, come and say, Hey, by the way, do you need lodging? So that's what happens with this traveler in judges 19. Okay. He is welcomed and given significant hospitality. Now we can add to this. Okay. We have to add to this, the fact that Joseph and Mary were traveling to their ancestral hometown. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I definitely believe that they were staying with relatives, okay? And I think that I think that is the most likely possibility is that they were at Uncle Moshe's house or whatever, and they just walked into town and went straight to his house and said, here we are, right? Yeah. But if even if it wasn't that, even if that was not the case, this was their ancestral hometown, the city of David in a hospitality culture. Yeah. Right? So even if they had gone into the town square and sat down and no one was like really paying attention, all Joseph would have had to have done was start to recite his genealogy mm -hmm. and say, Hey, I'm Joseph, the son of the son of the son mm -hmm. of the son of David. And not only would have they been invited, they would have been celebrated. Yeah, because these were these were royals. They're they were royals. of the royal house. Well, you also see in scripture where they talk about the hospitality that you could be, you know, entertaining angels unawares. Correct. That's where that and 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 that's another great observation because the reason we have that in the New Testament is because of the hospitality culture in the Old Testament. That's mm -hmm. the reason we even have that is because they were so encouraged to be hospitable to strangers that now we have this wonderful counterpart in the New Testament says, yeah, you should definitely be hospitable to strangers because you never know when you might be hosting an angel. Yeah. But yeah, it just, it just goes to this big picture, right? This big picture of what really would have happened to Joseph and Mary, right? And also just to throw this in there, she did not travel when she was eight or nine months pregnant. Okay. Yeah. She was, I don't think she was any more than four months pregnant. Okay. Now, I think that observation will shock a lot of people because I always thought she was like, you know, eight, nine months pregnant traveling on a, on a donkey or on whatever. Donkey. Right. And that that would be rather meticulous. So my understanding was, that, well, they had no room at the end because if you're traveling with a woman who's that pregnant, you're not traveling in a automobile but right. you're on a donkey that makes things even more complicated and they got in late so right. in my mind that would make sense but why is it you think that she was four or five months pregnant in the middle of her pregnancy okay well there's a again there's a variety of reasons i don't just have one piece of evidence <laughs> i have several okay one is that traveling that pregnant would be difficult and inconvenient regardless of the method yeah. Okay. If she's more than eight months pregnant, it doesn't matter whether she's walking, whether she's riding in a cart or whether she is supposedly riding on a donkey. That's an inconvenient time to travel. 
right? And you wouldn't do that unless you had absolutely no other choice, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, another reason I don't believe it is because I have traced the, the traditional nativity story to its source, okay? Now, its source are what is known as the infancy gospels, that were apocryphal literature written in approximately 200 AD. The most well-known of the infancy gospels is the infancy gospel of James, also known as the Proto-Evangelium of James. And the, to, just to get to the point, because we're running out of time, the Proto-Evangelium of James is an utterly untrustworthy document. Mm -hmm. You cannot believe anything you read in the Proto-Evangelium of James, not even the most benign fact. Hmm. Okay, Because when you examine the Proto-Evangelium of James, every other verse is demonstrably incorrect. Okay, None of these things could have or would have happened. So even if you take something extremely benign, like Mary riding on the back of a donkey, you have to say, Mm, I don't trust this document, right? But that's where the tradition comes from. Is well, it, why did this why did this document uh, gain so much uh, prominence? Okay, well, just because it became the tradition, right? And under the right circumstances, when you tell a fable, okay, mm -hmm. history becomes legend, legend becomes myth, and then it just gets sown everywhere. And then if that story becomes popular, and especially if it becomes popular uh, within an institution that yeah. then defends and protects and promulgates that tradition, yeah. then, then you've got a real problem. And that's exactly what happened is that it was way too long after the nativity to be historically accurate. It was plenty of time for it to be an entirely falsified record. And then it just got accepted and it got spread and became the tradition. But it's in that record that Mary rides a donkey while pregnant. Hmm. It's right out of that book that says that she got down off the donkey and went into labor, basically, is what it says. And that's ridiculous. Hmm. Right. So that's I don't so I don't think she wrote a donkey because uh, it comes from that. So but real because we're we're gonna wrap up here in a sec. Part of the reason another reason I believe that uh she traveled at no more than four months pregnant is that they had to keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. Okay. No one could know. No one could know, which again is contrary to the traditional story because in the traditional story, Mary is discovered not only by Joseph, but by the populace. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the real story, in the biblical story, Mary is very secretive very secretive. And um, she runs off and visits Elizabeth and then comes back to marry Joseph because they're betrothed, right? But she comes back from visiting Elizabeth at three months pregnant, right? Roughly. Tells Joseph. And then Joseph says, we got to leave. We got to get out of here. We got to leave Nazareth. You can't get discovered because mm -hmm. if you get discovered, this whole thing is a wash. Well, she could be stoned to death. Exactly. That's that's one of the reasons. Precisely. She could be stoned to death. Right. So Joseph and Mary get married and then secretively decide to leave Nazareth. And then providentially, this uh, registration comes along. It gives them the perfect reason to have to leave Nazareth and never come back. They're just going to leave. They're going to go to Bethlehem. And then, hey, we just decided to stay. Yeah. And in Bethlehem, no one would know that Joseph and Mary had not been married for longer than Mary had been pregnant. See, if she'd been discovered in Nazareth, that's an entirely different scenario. But mm -hmm. she, she's only, but if, but they walk into Bethlehem with her four months pregnant because she's, if she's, and see, the other thing is if she's four months, it's questionable whether she's showing yet. Mm -hmm. She's right on the edge at four months where the loose fitting garments of that day and time, you might not have been able to tell yet. But by the time you get to five months, now you're talking, you got to be showing even in the loose fitting garments. Yeah. And the other thing I'd like to point out is in the middle three months, the middle trimester uh, is probably the safest time that she could travel, not the first three or the last three. Correct. Absolutely. So, so just one more reason yeah. that I think she was about four months pregnant and then we'll just, we'll stop here because we're running out of time. 
which is that the final reason is that the Bible plainly says, while they were there, the time came about that she should deliver her baby, right? And it doesn't tell us how long that is. It just says while they were there, okay? But if they showed up in Bethlehem at four months, then, well, just stay in Bethlehem until we have the kid. Mm -hmm. So five months later, ta-da, there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, and go. nobody would question anything. They, and no, they, one would say, no one would say a thing because, yeah. you know, it, it, they're they're married at this they're point. They're married and they're having a kid. They're married but, and they're having a kid. But that never happens, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're, they're that's funny. They're married and they're having a kid right away. Whoa, that never happens at all. No, <laughs> yeah, especially that in happens. that culture. Yep. So, well, Kevin, we're going to wrap it up there. Is there anything you want to add really quickly as my guest for the day? Uh, hey, just thanks for having me on. And folks, I hope you can check out his show uh, every Friday night, 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I think you'll really like it. And it gets replayed, Tim, a lot of times uh, over the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, it it'll get a time to get replayed. So if you listen over the weekend, you'll catch replays of the show. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. So to all my listeners out there, thank you for listening. This is Tim Kyes with GodSaveTheKing.org. Make sure to join us every Friday night on the Truth Be Told Radio Network at 10 p.m. Eastern. Have a good night. Good night.